The need to grow to the limits of our capacities, to become what we potentially are. I think of the extraordinary line which uh, Mallarmé wrote in his sonnet about Edgar Allan Poe, where he says, Tel qu'en lui-même enfin l'éternité le change. As eternity changes him into himself, we don't have to wait for eternity. It is possible to become ourselves in the fullest ego-transcending form, even in this life. In fact, there's something very unworldly about this man who has concluded that intelligence and virtue are the ends of life. His eyes have that abstracted, gelatinous look of the nearly blind. And altogether, he would be a rather forbidding skeleton of a man if he were not so intensely gentle. This is a documentary. This is primarily a question. This is many and diverse contradictory desires. But this is a guarantee of truth. If I say that Aldous Huxley wrote, but the only hope for the world of time lies in being constantly drenched by that which lies beyond time, what is being repeated is the asking for your remembrance of your own nature. And from this interrogation, our communality can be born and then lived as realization and compassion. This is not a proper documentary. The project is not about the chronology of Huxley's life, but about his ideas. Gene Houston, Senior Advisor to the United Nations on Matters of Human Development. Aldous Huxley loved Homer, and I think he'd be vastly amused wherever he is, Maybe right here. If we began by invoking his spirit in the same way that Homer and the opening lines of the Odyssey invokes the story of Odysseus. And the lines translated in English are Sing in me muse and through me tell the story of the man of many ways. And yet, Aldous being a student of languages would have probably enjoyed it if we all did it together in ancient Greek. And I don't mean any piddling platonic Greek, I mean Homeric Greek, which would have sounded bardically like Handro Moyenepe Musa Polythropus. So let's all do it. If you'd all stand up, we're going to invoke the spirit in ancient Greek of a man of many ways. I'll give you the lines. Andro moi enepe. There was a lot of expression. Andro moi enepe. Musa. Musa. Holy tropu. Holy tropu. Say in the news that through me tell the story of the man of many ways. Today we sing the many ways of the man who was Aldous. Huxley. We have to attack on all the fronts. I mean, just as we have to attack the individual human problem on its psychological, its physiological, and its social front, so we have to attack the, the, so, uh, the general social problem on its organizational front and also on the front of, uh, uh, of uh, individual training and education. I mean, I think it's absurd to say that we can you can only do one thing rather than another. We must do both. I mean, nothing short of everything is ever enough. He begins as a satirist. He ends as a prophet. He comes on the scene as a social critic and leaves it as a social artist. Between the novels Chrome Yellow and Island, there is the journey of the son of the intellectual aristocracy of England, the the grandson of Thomas Huxley, the great social philosopher and scientist, the brother of biologist Julian Huxley, the grandnephew of the novelist Matthew Arnold. I was born in the brave new world of November 3rd, 1957. 
The same day that a half-ton Sputnik 1 rocket carrying a dog was put into orbit by the Soviets. The dog, Aleka, was kept alive for 10 days, proving that life could survive prolonged weightlessness in the other than unknown conditions of outer space. My parents were considering calling me Sputnik number one. I would have been the first space age punk. The abolition of free will by methodical conditioning, the servitude made acceptable by regular doses of chemically induced happiness, the orthodoxies drummed in by nightly courses in sleep teaching, advertising, Soma, Prozac, music television. Everyone belongs to everyone else. The whole history of recent times in relation to science and technology shows that if you plant the seed of applied science or technology, it proceeds to grow, and it grows according to the laws of its own being. And the laws of its being are not necessarily the same as the laws of our being. Technology accelerates our progress, but this is often only a progress towards acceleration. Do you all remember, I suppose, that beautiful and inspired saying of our thoughts, history is bunk? He waved his hand, and it was as though with an invisible feather whisk he had brushed away a little dust, and the dust was Harappa, was Earth, the Chaldees, some spiderwebs, and they were Thebes, and Babylon, and Knossos, and Mycenae. Whisk, whisk! And where was Odysseus? Where was Job? Where were Jupiter, and Gautama, and Jesus? Whisk! The place where Italy had been was empty. Whisk! The cathedrals. Whisk, whisk! King Lear and the thoughts of Pascal. Whisk. What I may call the messages of Brave New World, that it is possible uh, to make people contented with their servitude. I think this can be done. I think it has been done in the past, but and I think it could be done even more effectively now, because you can provide them with bread and circuses, and you can provide them with endless amounts of distractions and propaganda. I first read Huxley's Brave New World when I was nine years old. The year was 1967. Was the novel science fiction or a portrait of the world that I was going to eventually have to find my way in? The horrific vision of voluntary acquiescence to the solidarity of a world civilization bent on the twin directives of thoughtless pleasures and ordered efficiency. A thoroughly narcissistic society without an aspiration towards beauty or grace and without the troubles of the contemplation of a soul. October the 21st, 1949. Dear Mr. Orwell, the nightmare of 1984 is destined to modulate into the nightmare of Brave New World. The change will be brought about as a result of a felt need for increased efficiency. Thank you once again for the book. Yours sincerely, Aldous Huxley. Impersonal forces of population and over-organization and social engineers trying to direct these forces are pushing us into a new medieval system. Now, what should you mean by that? Well, I meant that uh, in this uh, uh, utopian novel of mine, Brave New World, I describe not exactly a medieval system, but a kind of scientific caste system and that um, uh, it was controlled, uh, not by force, but by the manipulation of human minds and bodies. And I would think that, or uh, I would think that it's true that there are impersonal forces pushing us in the direction of central totalitarian control. And also, uh, what is to me very interesting, it looks as though the totalitarian regimes of the future will not be based upon terror, because they will have other means. These means now at present described as brainwashing and, and propaganda, which will be much more efficient and much more economical than uh, and pleasurable force, and more pleasurable to those uh, who undergo them. I mean, there are techniques uh, available at present which do seem to 
duplicate some of the techniques that I invented. when you wrote Brave New World. Uh, there was a kind of uh, certainly implicit pessimism here about the future, about man. Yes, and unfortunately, of course, uh, I, I put all the events in Brave New World in the seventh century after Ford, uh, and a great deal of it has come true within 27 years, whatever the period is since I wrote it. I'm, I'm often very alarmed of, uh, at what uh, has already happened in the way of... Um, the prophecy is being fulfilled. And I do think that uh, we seem to be moving in that direction, that there seem to be a number of impersonal forces pushing that way and a number of technological discoveries which can be used to accelerate the movement in that direction. Do you hold any fears that some uh, future dictator, to use the term, might use such things as uh, mass communication, the newly discovered drugs, subliminal suggestion, uh, what's called brainwashing, uh, all of these new motivational research, all these new techniques for I'm quite gaining sure. consent. I'm quite sure they can do it. After all, it's, to a considerable extent, it's been done. I mean, the brainwashing is already a, a fact. And the point is that technology is continuously advancing. I was talking, for example, yesterday with the man who did the uh, much of the basic research work in this um, uh, subliminal projection. He said at the moment it presents no uh, great threat, but he said the uh, technology is on the march and we shall undoubtedly have within a few years extremely effective methods for using this and for persuading people to do things without their knowledge. You've been currently working, as I understand, on a, some articles on the new threats to liberty that grow out of these attempts to control society. What I'm trying to persuade people is that they should think in advance of what's going to happen. I mean, the trouble, well, one sees this again and again, that people have allowed themselves to be taken by surprise by the advances in technology. There's really no reason why we should be. I mean, given the available evidence and given a certain amount of imagination, you can foresee some of the consequences of this. And uh, if you foresee, you can do something to mitigate the effects. Hysterically definitive, thoroughly logical, repeated chants of zeros and ones gives you any number of numbers to a practical infinity of mathematically seasonable strawberry fields. The binary diffuses an exactitude of similitude, reigns an illusion of perfectitude through continual electronic switches allowing and disallowing in algorithmic procedural commands. So what does this reflect but an inhuman patience, an alhambraic monotony of labyrinthine design? Terminal language, program language. The adjustable face of grammar, the originating of human intelligence, replaced by the nervous excitation of an immaculate mask of distinct memory but no resemblances. The face of the human is our first human word. The face speaks profoundly of the differences among humans and of the sameness of humans. I am a white male filmmaker. My actor, David Odiambo, transfigures my speech, colors my words with his own unique intonation. In cyberspace, there is no need for a face and its mark of mortality. In the code of the binary is the metaphoric Rosetta Stone to a language beyond our own humanity. This is its promise and its horror. That is the today of our brave new world. I mean, hence the, uh, the, this uh, sense of which so many people have, and which I think one sees in so many societies, this sense that man is being subjected to his own inventions, that he is now 
the victim of his own technology and the victim of his own applied science instead of being in control of it. Where the caustic history of capitalization